You know, I think one of the gifts, if anybody reads William Stringfellow, and for sure me, is William Stringfellow calls you to be braver. You know, he calls me, at least when I'm engaging his work, it's like, you need to speak with more boldness. You need to not shy away from the argument sometimes that I want to, because I want people to like me. I don't want anybody to think I'm heretical or so radical that I can't be friends. And then I read Stringfellow and I think, oh my gosh, you need to really clarify your arguments. You need to say things better. You need to not, like I said, be braver in that work. That's how he affects me. And I think that's probably how I think of him like a Jeremiah prophet sometimes, like, you know, the prophet's words are hard words to hear, and I can't imagine how hard it is to speak it, but when you read them and you imagine people like Stringfellow and Jeremiah proclaiming those words, it does make you want to, like, say, I want to be braver, and I want to speak such profound truth that it makes the earth tremble. Welcome to Can I Get a Witness, the podcast. This podcast is an audio companion to the book, Can I Get a Witness? 13 Peacemakers, Community Builders, and Agitators for Faith and Justice. I'm Shay Tuttle. In each episode of this podcast, I'll talk with one of our authors about the person they profiled for the book and about their writing process. Today, I'm talking with Becca Stevens. Becca Stevens is an author, a priest, and the founder and president of Thistle Farms, a global community of survivors of trafficking and addiction that includes justice enterprises. For her work as an entrepreneur and a justice advocate, Becca has been named a White House Champion of Change and a CNN hero. She holds numerous honorary doctorates, and her most recent book, Love Heals, was published by Thomas Nelson in 2017. For our book, Becca wrote on William Stringfellow. Well, thank you so much for talking to me. I appreciate you making the time. I'm excited to talk about William Stringfellow. Can you start out by giving a brief summary of Stringfellow's significance for people who might not know him? You know, William Stringfellow, like so many prophets in this amazing book, are people who aren't prophets in the sense of like that can see into the future but they clearly see into the present and they can speak into the truth of what's before them. So William Stringfellow was a man of the 60s, you know, 50s and 60s. He was, could see what was happening in the world, see the issues of poverty and war and their connections. He could see the limitations of the institutional church and how we could do better speaking about justice and living into our ideals. So he was a prophet of his time. He was rooted in that time and he was powerful and he used his, all his skills, his law degree, his theological insights, his ability to write, to proclaim justice for all. Yeah, that's great. I love your definition of a prophet, not seeing into the future, but seeing into the present. What do you think Stringfellow was glimpsing that he felt like he needed to speak about? I feel like Stringfellow was seeing that there was going to be a greater disparity between rich and poor, not just in income, but how justice is meted out, how housing is offered to people or available to people, how the industrial military complex was going to take over so much um, in the face of, of relations and dip, dis, diplomacy. You know, I mean, he could see a lot. He could see a lot about the signs of the times around him and, you know, feared. I probably, he feared, you know, something like Trump. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, and it's like, it's, it's so wild to read him now. I mean, he was all about full inclusion in the church and all of that has, in my mind, has opened up and been powerful and 
you know, it was like his pioneer work in, in, in inclusion in the church has paid off well. More of his prophecies on, you know, beware if we keep going down this path and how we we are just letting people see the short side of justice and the back side of anger and the insides of prison walls before we ever let them see the beautiful far side of a horizon or the top side of clouds, like the, the possibilities of this world. If we keep shutting people down, it's going to get worse. And he's right. And people are, you know, like if you just read your news feed now, mm-hmm. if you just read it, it's like, oh my gosh, you know, we are so divided. And we still so blame those who are poor or who have been the victims of violence. It's still such a blaming, awful experience. And it's almost like I can hear Stringfellow in all of it, almost going, of course, this is happening. Of course, we've been doing we've been doing this to people for a long time, and it's just getting more institutionalized. Mm hmm. Yeah, that's really powerful. Could you, um, do you have that excerpt, the, the first one that I um, sent you from the beginning of your chapter? Three times since my father was killed by a drunk driver. When I was just five and before my memories could take root, I have dreamed of him. Once in college, once in 2003, and most recently on a trip as I slept in the hills of Alabama. My father was an Episcopal tr- priest, and I have loved carrying on his legacy since my ordination in 1995. In my most recent dream, we were together in the sacristy behind a chapel, where vestments, candlesticks, and incense are kept. In the dream, I picked up two candlesticks given to me by my father's old mission church. He showed me how to open a secret compartment underneath the candlestick base, where I found wads of lamb's wool that he had hidden long ago. Lamb's wool is the traditional fiber that priests use to anoint parishioners with healing oil while administering the sacraments. When I took out the wool, another old man appeared in the sacristy with us. He had tears welling up in his eyes, and my father gave me permission to take the wool to dry his tears. I wasn't sure at first who this other man was, but I was sure of his heart and that he too had sacrificed a great deal to be a witness to the church. As I walked toward him, I suddenly knew that the man in my dream whose eyes I was anointing with my father's lamb's wool was William Stringfellow. In the dream and in the hours after waking, I felt compassion and awe and a profound gratitude for his life and legacy within and beyond the Episcopal Church. William Stringfellow's witness draws you into the wilderness of your own dreams. And his voice is the voice that compels me to live into my convictions as I try to reconcile the gospel to the political, economic, and social realities I live within. He is also a hard gospel to read. He challenges his readers to see the world with even more compassionate eyes and to speak to that world with a clear voice for justice. Thank you. I love hearing it in your voice. When was it that you dreamed about Stringfellow? I had just begun, I mean, I really had just really started to understand and learn about William Stringfellow and, you know, didn't realize I was going to fall in love with him. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And I think that was part of the dream. It was like, it was like falling in love with his words and his theology and his witness and having him, having him be with my father. I mean, that is powerful. You point out in your chapter that Stringfellow used stories a lot in his writing, um, which, of course, for me, brings to mind the example of Jesus teaching through parables. Why do you think Stringfellow relied on stories? I think Stringfellow longed to help people understand the basic justice issues he felt so passionate about. And if you just, you know, give people statistics, if you just reiterate your argument over and over, all that happens is people that agree with you think you're amazing and people that disagree with you dismiss you. (laughs) Yeah. You know, that's true. But through story, people are opened up. People are engaged. You know, they want to know who the hero is and how to engage that story. So in my mind, I think he did, I think he did it partly because that's how 
he experienced the world, but he was also, um, it's a great teaching device and it's a great way to help your audience be open to your arguments. So I'd like to ask you about the story of the tapestry from your chapter. Um, And for listeners who may not have read it yet, I'll just summarize briefly. Um, It's a story you tell where William Stringfellow is in his office. He's running late. He needs to leave for a flight to Boston. And the phone rings. um, And he's kind of unable to just let it ring. So he answers. And there's a priest on the other line who tells him that there's a woman in his office who is about to be evicted. um, And he's wondering what Stringfellow um, advises that he do. So they talk for a while and um, Stringfellow asks a few questions. And finally, um, it's getting later and later. He needs to go catch his flight. um, And he just says sort of impatiently, look, sell one of the tapestries from the church and pay the rent. Um, And then he goes. So, Becca, I'm wondering if you can just um, reflect on that story a little bit for us. What is it about that story that you think is so important in understanding William Stringfellow? Doesn't that just break your heart? It's so true and so sweet and so hard and so not what we experience in, you know, pristine, amazing cathedrals. I mean, it's like, it's, it's, it's such, that's what prophets do. They give us these hard truths. I mean, that's, that's not an easy story, but it's like, it's so beautifully close to the heart of Jesus that you can't help but be drawn in. And then also think, yeah, but then, but then, but then, you know, that's what happens in those, in the stories that Stringfellow gives you, you think, we can't do that. Think of all the the stuff we would be selling out of churches and how barren they would be and there'd be nothing left. And you start panicking almost because it's like we do think those are our things instead of holy relics are things to be used for love. But it's, I mean, in that one story, you are getting a radical glimpse into his theology. The idea of what is holy is what is given away. That's unbelievably radical that you know we should be more concerned about those who are hungry and losing their housing versus a sacred icon in a sacred space it's beautifully challenging it's beautifully engaging and it's humbling to hear it you know it makes me rethink my values again it really makes me rethink like uh what is it that I have that's like a tapestry in my own life? Or what do you have in your life that's like that tapestry that I'd rather keep the tapestry and let the woman be homeless? There's a lot of those things we have. I mean, that's the thing about Stringfellow. He's not just challenging, in my mind, the institution. He's challenging you and me. We're part of it. So in, in terms of Stringfellow as a kind of challenging figure, you write about his um, his work as a dissenter. And you connect his work with the commandment of Jesus to love the enemy. There's this, I love this line in your in your piece that says, um, lines are blurred by the light and power of this command, the, the command to love the enemy. What do you what do you mean by that? What lines do you see as blurred by love of enemy? And how do you think that leads Stringfellow into the work of dissent? how many lines are there? There's like a million lines and we keep, you know, to keep crossing them is such a brave thing. Whether it's a political party or whether it's a denominational line or whether it's a nation state line. I mean, there's a lot of different lines, an economic line, a theological line. There's all kinds of lines. And the call to love the enemy means that you can't use us and them, that it has to be I and thou. You know, and the holiness in each other. And to me, to be a dissenter means I am not defining myself on this on this side of any line or barrier. That I'm standing not in the middle, like I don't have a position, but I'm standing on the fringes with people. I'm standing on the edge. I'm standing on the precipice. I'm standing in the valley. I'm with people. Mm-hmm. And. And that's what, to me, dissension means, not that I'm going to tote any party line, whichever side of that line you're on. It means I'm willing to break ranks. I am willing to stand with, and I'm willing to speak my truth for the sake of love. So it rattles everybody. You know, you don't fit in well, 
And I've said this about Strength Bell. It's a hard gospel that he preaches. It is challenging for all of us. It's not like he wants any of us to feel comfortable. <laughs> you know, he's not, you're, you don't read him and think like, wow, I'm doing this really right. <laughs> <laughs> you read yeah. it, you you read Strength Fell and you're like, first of all, it's like, that is so hardcore. That is so hard. That is beautifully challenging. It's all these things. And then sometimes you just get mad at him. It's like, you know, who the hell do you think you are? You know, I mean, he he was an attorney. He was privileged in many ways. But he never stayed on that side or in that safe place. He moved and he he challenged himself. He challenged his long-term friend and partner. You know, they kept challenging themselves. I think that's what a dissenter is too. It's never like you get comfortable and say, okay, here we are. We've arrived. It's like, we got to keep going and marching and moving as pilgrims for love. Yeah. Yeah. You talk about his, how he had this tough love that was characterized by criticism or often characterized by criticism. And you write about how he criticized everything. I mean, nothing was immune from that. You, you talk about clergy and divinity schools and ecclesial bureaucracy, political parties, corporations, the justice system, sort of everything. So I think- <laughs> I know. know can you imagine going out for a beer with William Stringfell? It'd be exhausting, <laughs> wouldn't it? <laughs> right, right. Yeah. Um, so I'm wondering about what what price did he pay for being this kind of faithful critic and for, for preaching this hard gospel? You know, I only know through William Stringfellow's own writings and words that he experienced loneliness, that even though he was all about community, he also, he grieved deeply. He felt sadness and loneliness. And that's, again, a mark of a prophet. There are very few prophets who um, do this work who don't have that sense of being an outsider and being a dissenter, of not belonging. So I think he criticized so broadly and so widely and try to live so intensely um, into his truth that there was, he did pay a price and it was loneliness and it was, it had economic implications, you know, it had health implications. It, it was costly for him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, you know, that really striking image from your dream of the tears, you know, that there's a that you, you seem to sense even subconsciously, you know, a kind of sadness about him and some loss there. Um, so you mentioned Anthony Town. I'd love to talk a little bit about Stringfellow's relationship with Anthony Town. Can you read that second excerpt about their relationship? In 1962, at a party for the World Council of Churches, Stringfellow met Anthony Town. Some months later, they reconnected when Town came to Stringfellow's law office because he was being evicted. Within five months, they had moved in together. Five years later, when Stringfellow was battling a lingering illness, they migrated to Block Island, where they composed books and poetry and defended immigrants, criminals, and the economic poor. Stringfellow in town spoke of the death in Christ that emancipates a human being from bondage to death. They shared a theology of liberation from death and idolatry, and their collaborations arose from deep discussion and research. Town was a poet, and in a description of his work, Stringfellow wrote, I consider that Anthony regarded the use of the language as the distinguishing feature between that which is civil and human and that which is brutal and dehumanized. Town believed that America had chosen the latter use of the language and spent his life trying to write with language that would cause people to rethink entrenched notions through the power of poetic justice. For years, Stringfellow and Town lived on the island, fighting together for peace and human rights. Then suddenly and inexplicably, Town died in 1980. Stringfellow, who died five years later, recounted his first year of mourning in his tribute to town, A Simplicity of Faith, a book that combines a profound look at grief with intense theological reflection about living in the present. Stringfellow described being in love as a metaphor for the dual nature of being a person of faith. There are days when love is the very human endeavor and days when one is caught in the lover's sight, seen with God's eyes. 
The story of Stringfellow and his partner Anthony Town was not celebrated for the height, depth, and breadth of their relationship. What mysteries pass between them are mysteries for the ages. But their 17 years together inspired Stringfellow to walk through theological imaginings in ways beautiful and haunting. Their relationship was grounding for much of Stringfellow's writing, and it was Town who participated in Stringfellow's descent work, stayed by his side when they were arrested, nursed him back to health during his years of convalescence, and inspired him in a deeper and simpler faith during his period of mourning. Through Town's death, Stringfellow began to distinguish the grief, the grief of loss from the mourning he endured for his own life as a means to come to a simpler faith. Thank you. You write beautifully about town, which I'm sure means that Stringfellow did as well. How do you see their relationship shaping Stringfellow's witness in the world? You know, I was really careful to try to just, in that excerpt, write about what I had read. But there were many, many writings um, that talked about them as partners as lovers. You know, Stringfellow called for full inclusion of the church of gay and lesbians into all ministries. But he never, he never described his relationship to town in that way. And I believe, but I believe that he and Anthony, you know, were soulmates and partners. And because of each other, they did their work with more passion and fuller and, um, I mean, they loved each other for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you mentioned in your chapter that you, in your own work and life, that you've heard heartbreaking stories about the struggle of men and women to unite their sexuality and spirituality. How do you think your sense of Stringfellow and Town's relationship shapes your own witness in the world? When I read Stringfellow's work and when I read about his relationship, with Anthony, and when I read his book about grieving Anthony, you know, I recognized that story. It wasn't the first time I'd heard a story about um, people who loved each other who could never proclaim that love in the same way that heterosexual couples can or are seen and recognized as um, full married partners in this world. So I, I heard that story and recognized it, if that makes any sense. And I thought, you know, I mean, it was just, to me, it was like just an affirmation of the truth that the church has, you know, forever been part of the violence that gay and lesbian people and bisexual people, LGBTQI people have endured because of our institution forever. And so it was just like, to me, it was like that story was another witness to that truth. And so it's emboldening to all of us to keep hearing those stories. I mean, one of the things about what we are going through as a country right now in, you know, post hashtag Me Too and post the Kavanaugh, Dr. Ford hearings is, you know, we are recognizing there's a lot of stories, you know, there's a lot of stories. And what we can't do is get weary of hearing those stories because that is the path for healing. And, you know, people don't want to hear the stories sometimes. And it's like, you, can, you don't get to get tired of it. You do not get to get tired of it. We get to listen and we get to hear it. And to me, it's like Anthony and Stringfellow's story. We don't get to get tired of it because people are still experiencing that within religious institutions. So we get to hear it. Mm -hmm. And we get to we get to cry with them and we get to let it fire us up to keep speaking about love. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about Thistle Farms? I'd love to hear about your work there. And then, if possible, where you see kind of Stringfellow's spirit in that work. Oh, that's such a fun question. I love thinking about where is Stringfellow in the work of Thistle Farms. So Thistle Farms is a community of women who have survived trafficking, addiction, prostitution, it's housing, it's social justice um, enterprises, it's a national network in a global marketplace. So it's a lot of stuff. But the easiest way to think about what Thistle Farms is, is it's a movement for women's freedom that has practical and 
relevant implications. It's not a movement just like in ideas, but it has really practical implications. And that's how William Stringfellow fits into this work. William Stringfellow was not a man that thought about what it means to defend the economically poor or the disenfranchised from his high rise on Park Avenue. He went and moved into East Harlem and fought for people beside them and did this work. And he knew that there were, you know, huge economic implications to the justice work that he was doing. And to me, Stringfellow was a great reminder in this work that we always need to be practical and relevant and not be afraid to talk about the economics and the religious implications of our justice work, you know, that we can't shy away from it. He's all over Thistle Farms. He would love us. He would love, love, love all the women at Thistle Farms. I know it. Yeah, that's great. That's really fun. How how have you been changed by spending so much time with William Stringfellow? You know, I think one of the gifts, if anybody reads William Stringfellow, and for sure me, is William Stringfellow calls you to be braver. You know, he calls me, at least when I'm engaging his work, it's like, you need to speak with more boldness. You need to not shy away from the argument sometimes that I want to, because I want people to like me. I don't want anybody to think I'm heretical or so radical that I can't be friends. And then I read Stringfellow and I think, you need to really clarify your arguments. You need to say things better. You need to not, like I said, be braver in that work. That's how he affects me. And I think, I think of him like a Jeremiah prophet sometimes, like, you know, the prophet's words are hard words to hear. And I can't imagine how hard it is to speak it. But when you read them and you imagine people like Stringfellow and Jeremiah proclaiming those words it does make you want to like say, I want to be braver and I want to speak such profound truth that it makes the earth tremble. I wish I was that way. He, he's, he's amazing. How do you think Stringfellow is a witness that we need particularly today? You know, every one of the chapters that I have read and can I get a witness are words that seem almost more profound today, not outdated, but seem like we need to hear these words. These are great people speaking them. You know, we this could help us bridge our divide, care for the poor. We wouldn't be separating families at border. We wouldn't be having the discussion about believing women who come forward with their stories of abuse. We need people like Stringfellow who understood the connection between poverty in prisons, who understood the connection between naming someone as an outsider and then offering them the short side of justice. He got that, and we still have it everywhere today. We really still need to hear his voice. People will benefit by reading his words and, you know, feeling challenged and feeling braver. Becca, thank you so much. It's been really, really great to talk to you. Can I Get a Witness? The podcast is a production of the Project on Lived Theology at the University of Virginia, a research initiative whose mission is to study the social consequences of theological ideas for the sake of a more just and compassionate world. To learn more about lived theology, visit livedtheology.org or find us on social media. This podcast is produced, edited, and engineered by Jessica Seibert, and written, edited, and hosted by me, Shay Tuttle. Original music is by Drew Wilson. Special thanks to project director, Charles Marsh. The book, Can I Get a Witness? 13 Peacemakers, Community Builders, and Agitators for Faith and Justice is edited by Charles Marsh, Shay Tuttle, and Daniel P. Rhodes. It's published by Urban's Publishing Company and is available now. Thank you for listening to Can I Get a Witness, the podcast.